Well, good morning, guys. This is really cool. See all your friends down here, Aiden? That's awesome. So my name is Virgil. I'm one of the pastors on staff. And today is a very special day for me. And I'm going to take a moment uh, because I get to baptize my son this morning. And this is a beautiful thing. And Aiden here has been on this faith journey for a while. And we've been having great conversations, even down to he's tried to get his sister saved, I think, 37 times. And uh, she likes giving me a hard time. No, not yet. And it causes him great concern. But uh, I love how he really gets it. When you talk to him, he gets a love for Jesus that he is his Lord and Savior. So, Aiden, I've got a question for you. Do you Have you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Yes. So upon declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and that he is the Son of God, and by his authority I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. got Ernest wet. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, uh, I too uh, get to baptize one of my kiddos, London, um, this morning, and we are super excited to be here. So um, what a beautiful thing. Um, several weeks ago, I was asking you some questions and we were talking in the car and I said, why do you want to be baptized? And, and London told me, well, in Studio 56 the other day, um, I, I've known the Lord for a while and love Jesus, but uh, London told me that it really hit me that I really matter to God really matter to him. Um, and so Jesus uh, loves you, London. I know you love him. Uh, but uh, is Jesus Lord of your life and Savior of your life? Yes. Wonderful. Well, it's a joy and a privilege to baptize you today in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. there's a, a better thing to do on a Sunday morning than celebrate new birth. So as, as one who's never been known to sticking to my notes well, I totally forgot something. Uh, tonight, if you come to the One Chili Night, number one, if you haven't registered, please register just so we make sure we have a good head count. Uh, we, this, this is one of the largest uh, head counts we've seen in the past. We have a lot of people coming tonight. We just want to make sure we have a, enough supplies. Also, bring your lawn chairs, your blankets, whatever that looks like, because weather permitting, we'll be outside, and it's just a great opportunity to just spread out all across our campus here. So, all right, you guys ready to jump into Apologia Session 5? Uh, today, we're talking about hidden worldviews, and uh, we've been in this series uh, four sessions in. Now we're in the fifth session. Next week, we'll piggyback, and we'll talk about living out your worldview. Uh, then Pastor Scott will come and teach on cultish. If you've been a part of our Wednesday night cultish class, oh my goodness, it's, it's been one of my favorite classes that I've ever been a part of. I just get to sit in there and run around with the microphone and, and help people ask questions and comments. But uh, And then the last week, we'll talk about redeeming pagan practices. Can we redeem pagan practices for the gospel, right? A lot of people have, well, we can take tarot cards and we can make them Christian. And so, well, what does the Bible have to say about that? So uh, today, the big ideas. Today, I'll be honest with you, I was not thinking this was going to be as um, in your face as, as it was, but this is just really, we're just going to read some scripture, and this is going to be very confronting, very convicting to us. And so remember, you've got to love Nate. You don't have to like Nate, right? <laughs> the Bible tells us we love one another. You don't have to like me, but I'm just bringing the message of what the scripture tells us here. Uh, hopefully it's, it's been interpreted well, but the big idea is for today. Number one, there is a worldly system that is contrary to biblical truth that wars against your soul. That's the first big, big, big idea today. So there's this worldly system, whether it's a spirit or a mindset, you know, a demon that sits on your shoulder, however you want to define it, there is a system of the world, we're going to see this in scripture, that wars against your soul. Number two, we want to have self-reflection today to isolate areas where there's hidden worldviews, alien to Christianity, and how they have crept into our thoughts and our lifestyles. And so again, I think the 
the, the takeaway on that one today is it's not the ones that are glaring in our face. It's those hidden ones that we don't realize that are there warring against us. So the third takeaway today is to provoke you as a follower of Christ to adopt and to live out a Christian worldview. And I've said this for years, and I believe it to this day. I don't think most American Christians have a Christian worldview. I just don't see it. We say one thing. And we do the other thing. We don't follow God's word. We, we talk a good talk, but we live a life with all of these other influences that speak louder to us and therefore become what become uh, our decision-making facilities and then what we do with those things. And many times it's contrary to Scripture. And so those are the big ideas. First Peter chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to read four, four different places of Scripture here uh, from Peter, from Paul, from John. Uh, Peter said this, They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation. So if you're a born-again believer in here today, this is speaking to you. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. He's saying there is a separation, there's something different. You are to be separate from holy set apart, sacred, a chosen people. And so there should be a difference between a believer and a non-believer in the spiritual sense and how that affects all of our decisions and what we do. And then it says, so that we could proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Does my lifestyle, does my decisions or do my decisions, does the, the things that I live my life and surround myself with, does it praise God, does it bring glory to God, or does it just go along with the mainstream of what everybody else is doing and I don't look any different? You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You once had not obtained mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you. Listen, listen to the language there. I beg you. He's pleading with us here. This is not just some, hey, if you want to do this, here's a suggestion. He's begging. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. Aliens, our citizenship is not here, it's in heaven, but so many of us live our lives with like, it's here, it's right now. We may think today is the most important thing, and we don't live for eternity, we live for the here and now. But he says, because you're soldiers and pilgrims, uh, pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So... Do people look at my lifestyle and they want to glorify God or reject, if that makes sense, because they're saying, okay, there's something different. Let's just lay, leave it there. Is there something different about how I live my life, the decisions I make, the things that I watch, the things I listen to, than a non-believer? That, that's a challenge. That should be convicting to all of us. I think all of us can leave here today saying, oh, the Lord's challenging me in some area. You cannot please God and culture. You cannot please God and the system of the world, the spirit of the world, which we're going to define here in, in a little bit more in a minute. You're going to offend one or you're going to offend the other. Now, the problem is, I think most Christians in America, we, not, I don't say most, but a lot of Christians, we just kind of, we think we found this neutral playing field, that we're just kind of going our, about our lives. But as we're going to see here, there is no neutral playing field. You're serving one or you're serving the other. And so Romans 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brother. And again, he's begging us. He's pleading with us. He's saying, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. And the word holy, again, means separate. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or your act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, which means we can be conformed to this world. The patterns of this world. The mindset of this world. He's saying, don't be conformed to that, but be transformed. Transformation, again, is that inward work, the metamorphosis, the, metamorphosis, the, you know, the, the caterpillar to a butterfly, that when Christ changes you, there's such a change, a transformation, that you're not the way that you once were. Religion says, I'm going to align with some rules and regulations. The gospel says you're transformed to where you're not the same person. The law is now written on our hearts, and now we have the fruit of the Spirit, the transforming work. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, he's telling us we can renew our minds, or we can be conformed to the patterns of the world. This world, remember last week we talked about anti-intellectualism and, and intellect matters and all of those things. This, again, is an intellectual conversation because we can do something about it. Paul's telling us, Peter's telling us, you get a choice in this. You have a free will decision, and when you choose to do nothing, you're making a decision. Does that make sense? 
you're choosing. So, so let's just bring it into politics. And you say, well, you know what? I didn't vote for anybody. No, you did. You, by not voting, you voted. You, you chose to do something by not doing anything. By not speaking up many times, we're choosing to let the louder voices speak up. And so there is no middle ground in these conversations. Again, we're talking about doctrinal moral things. We're just not talking about, you know, the average, you know, should I eat a Big Mac or should I eat Burger King, right? Th those aren't the conversations. We're talking about the moral doctrinal conversations. That's what apologia is all about. Remember week one, apologia is a defense of the faith, that we should have a defense for the hope that is within us. First John chapter two, verse 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. So if you've been through the journey, we talk about early on in the journey, this is not talking about the people. It's talking about the world system, the patterns of the world. Just like with cultists, every week Scott opens up and says, we're not attacking people who are lost in cults, we're attacking the systems. So this is not contradicting here. He's not saying don't love the people. He's saying do not love the world or the system of the world. And in the context uh, in 1 John, he's talking about that system of the world. Do not love the world or the things of the, in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's tough language, isn't it? But is this... Is this some obscure verse that Nate just pulled out of the Bible and it's not consistent with the rest of the Bible? No, this is the theme of the gospel. Holy, separate, set apart, consecrated. If we're going to have a, a defense for the hope within us, we have to know what that is. And so this hidden worldview conversation, again, it begins with, man, there are these mindsets or systems that are contrary to God's word, that if I'm not vigilant, if I don't take the admonition of Scripture, I will fall prey to those things. And then the end result might be works of the flesh instead of the fruits of the Spirit, fruits of righteousness. 1 John 4, 2, by this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the Spirit of God the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. So again, not the Antichrist, the person. Again, it's the spirit of. So this is first century, and he's saying this spirit, this mindset, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, this pattern of the world, whether it is a literal spirit, like I said earlier, a demon sitting on your shoulder, I don't know, whether it's just a mindset, whatever it is, it's something that we are called over and over and over to be vigilant and knowing that it's there and then living our lives contrary to it. Romans 8, 5 through 8. Okay, I had five. Sorry, I thought I had four. For those who live, who, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So you're setting, or, you're setting your minds on the things of the flesh or you're setting your mind on something else. See, all of this implies we have something to do with this. And I've said this for years and I'll say it just maybe for some of the new folks. We get so... We talk about salvation and we talk about glorification, but we miss this whole sanctification part. You know, God does everything in salvation. I don't have anything to do with it. He just saves me. True, you have to have faith, right? It's not a work, but it's, you have to do something. But then sanctification, that is all about you. You're choosing what God is saying, do this or don't do this. God's not going to magically, just supernaturally sanctify us. That's part of the process. All these places of sanctification is us making the decision to do these things. So, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So what are we setting our minds on, our, our mental facilities, our worldview, our understanding of how the world works? Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That word actually means enemy. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And here's the thing. So many people, when you read verses like this, people just immediately want to jump to, are you questioning my salvation? We're not talking about heaven and hell in those conversations. But I don't understand why people are always asking this once saved, always saved. Like so many times, I had it this weekend. Somebody asked me about, about Catalyst. And, well, do you believe in eternal security? Once saved, always saved. I'm like, look. There's people that can see all different ways. If you today are abiding in Christ, you don't have to worry about if you're eternally secure tomorrow. Now, you can't lose your salvation like you, you can lose your keys, right? Oh, dang it, what did I do with my salvation? I think I can't find it. It's not, not what I'm saying at all. But why do we jump to this? Are you questioning my salvation? Instead of saying, 
We're talking about when you abide in Christ, when you're vertically driven, when you're intimate with Jesus, you don't have to question the tomorrow. That's like asking Monica, are you going to love me in 30 years? It's like, I love you right now. Like, what, what, are you, what, are you, what are you getting at? Like, am I eternally secure in our marriage? Like, I, no, it's, it's what are we doing right here, right now? Because today becomes tomorrow, which then is what? Today. God's given us now. So that's why we're all about abiding in Christ. If you remain in Christ, a lot of these questions get pushed to the sideline. But the question should be, today as I abide in Christ, how does it transform my life? And then how does it help me to change my mind to follow the things of the Spirit and not the things of the flesh? No matter where you are in your walk with God, we're all a work in progress. None of us has arrived. None of us is perfect. None of us is super mature. We're all struggling in all areas of our life. So some traditional worldview, well, let me say this. We're all struggling in some area of our life, but that's what the Holy Spirit's for. That's what the Word of God, that's what biblical community is, is for, is to help us live um, victorious in those areas in our life. So let's dive into some traditional worldviews. So a worldview and definition is a collection of attitudes, values, stories, expectations about the world around us, which inform our every thought and action. Uh, it can be a pattern of ideas or beliefs, convictions, and habits that help us that make sense of God, the world, and our relationship to God and the world. So again, when you talk about a worldview, it's, it's, it's a lot of things wrapped up. But uh, just, just looking at that definition, it's the attitudes, the stories, the things that we see on a regular basis, the things that we, we take in and then they change how we think and how we live and how we respond in relationships. A worldview is how a culture works out in individual practice. When you encounter a situation and think, that's just wrong, your worldview is kicking into action. Uh, we have a natural tendency to think that what we believe is normal. His views are backwards and superstitious, but my views are a result of how I was brought up. I'm rational, I'm balanced, and I'm true. So we all tend to think that our worldview makes sense, right? So the world's become really small with technology, right? And with, with the way that the borders have opened up. And we, we, we as Americans tend to think the rest of the world thinks and acts like us. And then when we see somebody contrary to that, that's like, well, they're weird. We've taught our kids, look, the word weird is, it's a word in the English language and we use it. But we're, we're all weird in some way. Weird has a connotation of you're bad and I'm good. So when we're talking about worldview, let's just, let's just use this as an example. When I moved to Northwest Arkansas and I heard about this squirrel, uh, this yearly squirrel cook-off, right? Now, for me, I thought, that's amazing. Like, whoever, whoever created this is a genius. Like, I think this is wonderful. But other people I've talked to, like, man, this place is a bunch of hillbillies. They literally kill squirrels and eat them and fry them up. And see, why is it wrong? Why is it bad? And why does one person say, well, I grew up kind of hillbilly out on the farm. And I mean, that's pretty cool. I like squirrel, right? I like rabbit. I like wild game. That's just me. But why is it that one's right and one's wrong and one's weird and one's not? It's cultural. Next week, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about traditions and, and why we think the way that we think and is one right and one's wrong. Why is, well, we'll get into that next week. But when you think about this, we're, we're, lar we're largely unaware of the wheels that are moving on our car. Do you ever think as you're driving down the road, man, I sure appreciate my wheels, right? You know, you don't. But when you blow out a tire, all your affections and thinking goes right to that, right? Oh my goodness. Well, worldviews like that, it's just, it's, it's how you see things. And it has, again, how you were brought up, race, background, religion, culture, all of those things matter. And so now we have to say, okay, what is a Christian worldview versus what are some of the other worldviews? And how do I live out that Christian worldview? But we have to define worldviews first. And so um, our worldview does not merely reflect what we think about the world or how it's like. It directs what we think the world should be like. In other words, our worldview not only describes reality, it prescribes how we act and respond to every aspect of life. Because our ideas do determine how we behave, the bottom line is that our worldviews or ideas do have consequences. So it's not just how you see the world, but you think how you th or how you think the world should be. And this goes into all areas of life, which we'll see here in a minute. Some common worldviews there's so many out there, but these are kind of some of the most talked about ones. Christianity is a worldview, which is also religion, but Islam, secularism, Marxism, new spirituality, postmodernism. So these are some common worldviews. And so I remember as a junior or a senior in high school, 
uh, taking, understanding the times. It was a year-long class, a worldview class, and it opened my eyes to these things. And I've been a nerd on this ever since because it's just, it's crazy to think how easily I believe this and think that because that's what the cartoon that I watched said. And that's what the preacher preached. And that's the way this, you know, when I grew up, I'm getting a little next week, but smoking, drinking, dancing were just of the devil, you know. But we could play cards. Cards were fine. Other, like you go to other regions and other types of denominations, you play cards. Well, you're dealing with devils right there. It's like, but why is that? Well, the Bible doesn't prescribe any of those things as, none of those things were true, what I just said biblically. It's all tradition, and it's all where you grew up, and it's how you grew up. And so this is a vitally important conversation to apologia, because if you go out provoked to be a defender of the gospel, and you start defending your own traditions and your own worldviews, you're going to lose. The gospel is at the top. That's why we've said this for years. It's the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. It's not about when's Jesus coming back, and it's not about, you know, how the gifts of the Spirit are expressed. It's about the gospel at the top, and everything else falls underneath those things. And we get caught up in the side conversations, and so we have to be aware of these things. So areas or the context of which our worldviews are expressed or lived out. Here's just a couple. Theology, philosophy, ethics, biology, psychology, sociology, law, politics, economics, history, you may say, well, I don't know about all that. Just start picking up when you listen to people and you start hearing their worldviews based on how they're expressing in these different areas of life. And it'll just shock you. It'll, it'll, just, it'll just blow your mind. But here, here's the thing with Christianity and, and a lot of Christians in America today. We are very ineffective in culture because we approach these conversations in isolated environments. We look at sacred as sacred things of God, like church. And then we look at everything else as secular. And so a lot of people, they're sacred and they're secular don't mix. So they come to church, they do what's right, they love Jesus at church. But when they go to work, it's, well, that's just business. I've had people tell me, well, I can kind of get away with some things. I know it's illegal. You know, I know it might be unethical or moral, but it's, that's just business. So you see how they've separated those things. Politics. I'm blown away by how many Christians I can sit across the table and talk politics, and I start challenging them on certain topics, and they'll say, well, that's just politics. Well, that's not biblical. <laughs> like, when you do this and it doesn't align with the Scripture, now your politics is being lived out in a non-Christian worldview. The view of the family, ethics, and all of these conversations, these are vitally important because if you don't have a Christian worldview... You're not going to live it out that way, let alone you're not going to be able to defend against some of these others. So many who study traditional worldviews, they consciously begin with defining them because they can be defined, right? But let's move into now hidden worldviews. Everybody still with me? So we're moving into hidden worldviews. It's not the worldviews that begin as theories or intellectual systems that mold the lives and beliefs of most people. Instead, the most powerful influences come from worldviews that emerge from culture. That's the hidden worldviews. So we can spend all day talking about the regular worldviews and just say, well, I'm aware of that and I'm going to just not be, you know, sucked into that. But it's the hidden worldviews. They're all around us. They're so deeply embedded in our culture that we don't see them. If you're taking notes today, write this down. They're hidden in plain sight. So that doesn't make they're hidden in plain sight. They're right there. But we don't notice them. We don't realize that we're repeating things that are non-Christian worldviews, and now it's becoming our, our life ethics or our life mantra, or it just it feels good and it makes me it gets me up in the morning to go to work and do good. But sometimes they're not biblical, they're not Christian. And so we just don't think our way into worldviews, we experience them. It's not just a coherent. I'm going to make myself have this worldview. It's, again, it's how we experience things, and it's how we walk these things out in our relationship. Um, so let's look at some of the hidden worldviews. And, again, these are just ones I've pulled from different sources, um, belief systems or worldviews that are more hidden. Individualism, consumerism nationalism, all these are in the notes, and there's more in the notes. I put a lot in the notes during this series because I've been studying this for three years that is not going to get preached, and so there's plenty in there. Uh, plus our extra uh, resources. There's a whole page of extra resources if you want to study deeper. Uh, moral relativism, naturalism, new age, postmodern tribalism, 
uh, salvation by therapy or moral therapy deism. So let's look at a few of these. So uh, nationalism, that's one that's it's hidden, where a lot of people today will talk about, you know, they say God and country. Like they're on the same playing field. They're on the same level. God and country. Well, that's nationalism. Or, you know, I'm a Christian because I'm an American. I'm American, so therefore I'm Christian. See, that's nationalism. See, my citizenship is not here. It's in heaven. Love America. Love, love where God's placed me. But God has to always be at the top. We were part of a church in Illinois that they had a crusader flag on one side and an American flag. And guess what? There was no cross. And so the pastor said, hey, you know what? I don't like this. We're going to put up a cross. We're going to take down the others. The amount of people that left the church because they said that American flag should be up there with the cross. That's nationalism. It's become almost a cult and a religion in and of itself. We've seen this in the last four to six years, right? Just think about all the things you've seen that people just, you know, and, and I've had people talk about, well, I've got God and I've got my guns. Okay, that's great. I hug your guns, sleep with your guns. I'm a big gun guy. I love guns. Hold on to your second amendment, but it should be underneath the gospel. It should not be number one. So that's nationalism. And then there's all these other ones. You could th- moral therapeutic deism. We mentioned that a few weeks ago. This theology of God wants me happy, and it's all about, you know, God's going to make things easy for me in life. And so the end result or the end goal is, is for my theology is to make me feel good. Well, that's not, <laughs> that actually flies in the face of the gospel. Right. And so you have to look at these and say they're hidden. And we mentioned this a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to dive in deep. But all these books that Christians are promoting in their churches and these, you know, these conferences that they're sending their people to. And the conferences are basically giving people a big pep talk to say, you are so awesome the way you are. And that's the way God created you. And you just keep living in your sin. You just keep being you. And the gospel says, no, God created you, you know, uh, in perfection. Sin marred that. And you need a savior. And so you need the gospel. You need Jesus to save you. But this new mind mindset is just telling people you're just good enough the way you are. Jesus loves you in your sin. Jesus does love you in your sin, but that doesn't give him, that's not telling you that he's given you permission for your sin. He's saying you must be born again. You must be changed. You must be transformed. But these are hidden worldviews that creep in. We see it in our songs. I know Pastor Daniel, we talk about this a lot. I love our worship here because our worship is theology first. It's doctrinal driven. Uh, not a lot of our worship songs are going to be all about me, 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 what's in it for me. We can sing about how God's done things for us and that's okay. But the bulk of our worship here is about him and putting him at this highest place. He's supreme. He's God. And that's what we worship. But if we're not careful, everything we sing about is how it makes us feel. And we bring it down to this horizontal level. And that's a hidden worldview. Um, Many times these worldviews are not on our conscious thoughts because we don't encounter them in an analytical way. Like somebody doesn't come up to you and say, you know, I'm a Marxist and I want to talk to you about Marxism or critical race theory or all these things, right? They don't confront you that way. It's just these worldviews that are kind of kind of hidden. So let's remember a few weeks ago when I did the whole, were you here when I talked about the uh, Planet Fitness where I go to work out? And so uh, I read the article from the guy. And, you know, Planet Fitness, their whole thing is that it's a no judgment zone, right? You just be you. And I, I showed all the pictures of how it talks about you just be pretty and we're not going to do all these things. We're not going to challenge you, da, da, da. And so this guy shows up to Planet Fitness and he's butt naked and he says, hey, this is how I am. You can't judge me. Well, they arrested him and took him to the county jail. And his quote for the article was, I thought it was a judgment free zone. Well, apparently it's not. And so we went around and we showed all the pictures. When I walk into Planet Fitness, on a, a tomorrow morning I walk in, there are probably 15 signs. You can't do this, don't do this, do this. It's not necessarily judgment-free because what if I, I don't feel any judgment whenever I do this, but your sign says something different. See, they're preaching a worldview while they're telling you another worldview. They're telling you tolerance, but they're not being too tolerant to the naked guy, right? <laughs> I don't know. That's just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, a few weeks ago, I pulled some popcorn out. I'm not, I don't eat popcorn, but I was, I was on a mission, right? So I'm looking at all these worldviews, and then, so I'm, I'm going through the grocery store, but I, I pulled one off of our shelf at home, and it was called Lesser Evil Popcorn. When wellness guides your spirit, you are your own guru is the tagline, and there's a picture of a big Buddha eating popcorn. That's a message. That's a worldview. I went to get oat milk one day because I was out of my coconut milk. I'm more of a coconut milk guy, and I'm looking at my wife's oat milk, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to risk the calories. I want to double check what's going on. And there's this whole thing on the back page or the back side all about their worldview. 
They're not just selling oat milk. They're selling a worldview. When you buy our product, dot, 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 dot. You're supporting this. You should feel good about this. See, there's worldviews everywhere. And as a Christian, we got to be able to say, how do I combat this? Again, the answer is not to live in a commune and to go <laughs> live in a van down by the river, right? And to just be your own and just hide out. That's not the answer. The answer is to what we just read in all those verses, to be sober, to be vigilant, to have our minds, you know, uh, first of all, understanding what the Word of God is, but then comparing and testing against the Word of God. Uh, marketing, a lot of marketing tools involves creating content to where it's about less about the tool and about how it makes you feel and what it does for your life. So if you've ever seen Simon Sinek's uh, The Why video from like 20 years ago, he talks about Apple actually had inferior products to all these other companies, but Apple was marketing geniuses. And they had everybody lining up for hours and days to get this new technology, which was inferior to the technology we already had, but they made it cool. They made it, everybody thought, I've got to have this for enhancement in my life. I've got two Apple products right here this morning. We're being taught, we're being indoctrinated, we're being influenced all around us. The, the media, you, you watch, I, I'm not a big, I'm not really into a lot of media, but my kids love to watch these extras on the DVDs, right? And so many times you start watching the extras and you're just like scratching your head going, what did I just get myself into? Because they talk about why they did things they, the way they did, why they said what they said, the why behind it. And you're going, I just thought it was an entertaining movie. But guess what? There are multiple worldviews and mindsets, many times contrary to the biblical worldview, that we're just taking in because guess what? Man, that was a great movie. Man, that felt good. Man, it was awesome. But we don't realize if we're not vigilant, we're literally taking these into our minds. And if we don't combat those thoughts, transform our minds, if we don't take every thought captive and, you know, you know, challenge it against the word of God, these now become things in our life. Have you ever, I'm, again, I'm not a cusser. Um, I just never had a problem with cussing, but I remember in sixth grade, just, you know, walking down the hall and, you know, nobody, it was just a handful of people. And I forgot my um, permission slip to go skating. And I just said, oh, bleep. And wouldn't you know, this is my life right here. My brother could literally get away with anything. He'd have a fifth of vodka in his locker drinking it. And I did, I just said what I said. And Mrs. Mays, no teachers, I didn't think anybody's there. Nathaniel Sweeney, I've never thought you would talk like she gra literally grabbed me by the ear, took me down, called my mom. I was always getting caught, right? But why? Because I, I went back, even in that season, I thought, man, we've been watching a lot of movies with a lot of cussing. It wasn't something that I just consciously did. But it was something that was just in my psyche because I'd been watching and listening to it. You may say, man, you are just overthinking this. You are just being holier than thou. Well, holier than thou implies pride and arrogance. But to say I want to be holy and I want to be separate and I want to honor God's word, that's called being a disciple. That's called discipleship 101. That's called taking up your cross and following me. That's, like, that's called Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me. That, that's the picture that the, the average, basic, low-level disciple coming into Christianity should be walking out or at least being taught. These are the basics of Christianity, but we're so muddied in the church world today, and so a lot of these things get just lost. There are no neutral worldviews. They all live out their belief in a system uh, in the world around us. So just start, not, not sit there and like taking notes and nitpicking people when you're in your meeting at work, right? And say, well, my boss is a Marxist, right? My boss is a secular humanist, right? But begin to think through and to say, man, what, what's the angle here? Because most people do have an angle whether they know it or not. The antidote to indoctrination is to tell the truth. Expose people to the lies that would deceive them. Show them how to refute those lies and prepare them with the thinking skills necessary to continue resisting falsehoods. So I've said a lot today. There's a lot going on. We're going to take communion here in a minute. But just, just let these things settle in this morning. What are some worldviews in, in my life? What are some things that maybe have been contrary uh, to the gospel in my life? Maybe some things that um, how I treat my family or how I view certain things or, you know what, as a man, maybe you're saying, you know what, I, I believe that I should get my own time and I need my I need my Saturdays. Those are mine because I've worked hard all week when the scripture tells us that we should lay down our lives for our wives and as Christ loved the church. And I'm not saying don't take your own time, but you, you're unwilling to sacrifice because you think it's all about you and what you need rather than what does the scripture say? What do my kids need as a servant of God? What does my family need? What do people need that God's called me into uh, their sphere of influence? So 
As an abider in Christ, pray about these things. Think about these things. Ask the Lord to challenge you. And then go about your day and ask the Lord to bring that conviction in those moments. Ask the Lord to lead you. Uh, it could be something, let, let me just say this. Uh, it could be something as simple as this. So I'm one who's always, I, I used to go door to door. I love evangelism. I love to confront. I love to debate. Man, just, I just argue with myself sometimes. I just, that's, that's me. But I was at this coffee house about five months ago, and I'm meeting with somebody, and this, this young guy walks by. I thought he was a teenager. Found out later he wasn't. And man, he was just, the Holy Spirit just moved my heart, and I just, I just don't know why, but I just began to pray for this person. And so he left, and you know, just for the next few weeks, I was just praying for this guy. And I, I'm an intercessor. I've got a gift of intercession, so I pray a lot. But then a, a few months later, this guy walks into the gym. And so I see this guy, and I'm like, well, there's my guy, right? I've been praying for him. And so even then, when I work out at the gym, like, I'm so selfish. Like, I don't talk to people. I'm like, get out of my way. I, don't, I just, I'm very efficient. I'm not there to talk. I'm not there to have fun. And so for weeks, I'm just praying for this guy. And then I just, one day, this is just a few weeks ago, I just felt the Holy Spirit. He's sitting over there. You need to go talk with him. And I'm like, oh, so I love this, Lord. But now, like, this is my time. This is me. And again, I just felt the Holy Spirit, just that, that nudge. So I'm telling you. You don't have, it doesn't have to be, you know, spectacular. It doesn't have to be something just magical. It's something that simple. And so I'm like dancing around and I'm waiting, waiting. Finally, we're sitting there literally two just looking at each other. And so I just kind of walk over. I said, hey, uh, I took my earpiece on. I said, hey, I said, I I'm not a weirdo, but um, I'm a Christian. And he just looks at me. I said, okay, that didn't come out right. I said, I said, I'm a Christian, and I said, I just, you know, wanted to talk to you for a minute. And he just laughed. He goes, well, I'm a Christian, too. I don't know what that means. I said, I said I'm not hitting on you or anything. I'm just, you know, I have a purpose here. Because, again, it's weird. You know, find out he's not a teenager. He's, like, middle 20s. I just thought, and I said, look, I saw you, blah, blah, blah. Here's what's going on. And he put his head down, and he said, that day I was meeting with a pastor because I, I lead a small group at this church. And he said, I'm so discouraged because this just, we're not seeing fruit. And he said, I'm just discouraged. That day I was discouraged. So that day, I, the day I started praying for him, God had me pray for something. I have no idea. It can be that simple. And so I said, well, then I'll be praying for him. We just change names. And so I see him at the gym and, you know, how's his day going? And so it can be that simple. It can be other times where it's somebody who's lost and God asks you to share the, the love of Christ. It could be financially, whatever that looks like. But when you're walking in a Christian worldview, it's got to be gospel central. It's got to be saturated with the presence of God in, the, in prayer. What is God asking you to do? And what does that look like? So as we get prepared, if the worship team can come up, I got two uh, passages of scripture I'm going to read before we get into communion. While I'm reading these, if you don't have your Jesus uh, Lunchables, uh, we have them in the back if you want to get them. We're going to take communion here in a minute. Um, but I want you to be thinking, communion's a time of reflection. It's a time of repentance. It's a time of exalting Christ. But ask the Lord, God, what is it that, that I need to lay down in this time of communion? What is it maybe that I've allowed in the movies I watch or the music I listen to? If you're listening to music that's degrading women, but then you're looking at all these teenage boys and saying, you're never going to date my daughter because she's this little princess, you're part of the problem. That's just the guy that needs Jesus just as much as your daughter needs Jesus. But when you're paying somebody to sing the songs that degrade women, you're part of the problem. That's part of it. Like the Christian worldview should say, that's wrong. I don't care if the beat gets you going. I don't care. Well, I'm not listening to the message. Yes, you are. The message is being driven into your psyche. It's being driven into your decisions and your psyche, your worldview, to where you're living that out. So Colossians 2, 18, beware. Everybody say beware. beware. He's saying, again, these are... These are not just admonitions, but these are serious things. Beware lest anyone cheat you. So have you ever had anything stolen from you? Man, they took your debit card and they wiped out your account. Think about how that felt. Someone broke into your house and stole So I used to be a locksmith, so I'd come up to, I mean, literally walking into people's homes that are broken into and, you know, all kinds of thieves and different things. And the, the people just bawl. Man, they took my grandma's, you know, prize thing. He's saying... That same feeling you feel, that's how you should feel when somebody cheats you through philosophy, empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. When you walk at that low-level, non-Christian worldview, you're being cheated. Christ has exalted us, and he's seated us in heavenly places. He's given us so much more. Don't be cheated by a system that is down here. 
Don't be cheated by a system that tells you that you're never going to be free from that and you're never going to be able to change and that God made you this way and all that. I mean, what does God's word say about it? What does the truth of God's word say? For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the godly, Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all prince and power. You're complete in Christ. That's that righteousness conversation that we talk. You are complete in Christ. So again, I'm not saying go home and, 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 and burn all the, the, the music. And, you know. In my environment, again, I joke about my upbringing, but it was, it was pretty interesting. Couldn't, couldn't watch Smurfs and play Mario Brothers because of the demons, right? And that's a lot of my upbringing and a lot of Christians in that spree- season, right? To where now we invite the demons in through movies and media and the witchcraft and the, oh, it's just a movie. Is it? Is it just a movie? And you, and you may think, man, Nate, you are just taking this way too far. Am I? Or is that what the Bible is telling us? You think Paul played around with demonic stuff? You think he just went to the temple and said, I'm just going to be entertained by what's going on at the temple? I just don't think so. And when we get into week eight where we talk about can we redeem pagan practices, why would we want to? <laughs> Even if we could. Things that are so based in non-godly things. Why would we want? It's the whole, remember we've talked about this before, and we, we make a batch of brownies. And I give you brownies, and you're like, man, that tastes really good, and it is so wonderful. And I love those brownies. And then I tell you, oh, by the way, there's just a little bit of dog poo in them. You want another? It's just a little bit. Oh, there's just a little bit of Clorox. I spilled a, 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 a lid of Clorox in there. Just a little bit of poison. Again, it sounds silly and giggly, but that's sin. Paul said a little bit of leaven leavens the whole piece of bread or the whole loaf. It's the small foxes that get in and spoil the vine. And I'm not here to be on this bandwagon or beat this drum of, you got to stop watching this and don't listen to it. That is the Holy Spirit's role in your life. I mean, if it's blatant and it's clear, I don't, I don't know what else to tell you. It should be clear. But if it's unclear, you have the Holy Spirit. You have Christian liberties. That's what we teach at Catalyst. Hey, you be led by the Holy Spirit. But at the end of the day, we're going to call these things out because we don't want you cheated. The, the last one, Timothy. I charge you. Again, listen to the language. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Just think about that. Like, if I put that on the tagline of my sermon this morning, <laughs> basically what I'm about to say, you're going to be judged before God, who, who, you know, that's a pretty harsh statement. He said, you're going to be judged. Now, well, it's not salvetic. It's talking about we're still going to give an account for the things we do. That's very scriptural. Now, a lot of people argue, is it, you know, behemoth seed? Is that, you know, crowns? What is that? But setting your salvation aside, I'm saved, I'm born again. He says, you will be charged or you will be judged. I'm sorry. Who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom? Now, again, great white throne of judgment, behemoth seed judgment. Whatever it looks like, at the end of the day, you're going to appear before Christ Jesus. And it says you're going to give an account. Jesus said we'll give an account for every idle word that we utter. I don't know how that's going to be because I'm a talker. I'm a verbal processor, so I got a lot of idle words. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. That's powerful. He's, he's, this is a pastor. He's telling them, lead the people this way. For the time will come, they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up with themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So I would say, if we look at the first half of that, and we look at the second half of that, he's saying, if you're not careful to do these things, you'll be that middle group to where we are drawn away by not so sound doctrine, by things that make us feel good, by things that, you know what, Nate's a little harsh. I don't really like Nate. Well, you don't have to like me. And if you're called to Catalyst, then we have teaching team, we have different personalities, but we're going to stand on the word of God. And if you have an issue with that, let's sit down and talk doctrine. That's fine. 
But if you're going to get behind the doctrines of this church, we're going to argue that and we're going to hold each other accountable to that doctrine. Because I don't want to wake up one day and somebody in my life or myself, I've been drawn away because we didn't do some of these things. We didn't convince, rebuke, exhort with all long stuff. We didn't preach the word. We preached happy-go-lucky messages. But you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. So where does that leave you this morning? As we uh, prepare for communion.